and gentlemen, welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Robert Forte, a very interesting figure in psychedelia. He has a lot of experience with a lot of people in the field, and uh, I think odds are good you're at least going <laughs> to have a reaction to this. I, I think a lot of what he says is really worth discussing and, um, and knowing about. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a preface here since it's a pretty controversial subject area. Um, I don't know. Where, where do we want to start, Kyle? Yeah. Um, you know, Robert's got a really interesting story and I think it is worth hearing, <laughs> but like, you know, it, it's somebody's story. And so I, th- I think that's just like an important part to preface that we all have our different views when it comes to, um, history and, and what's been going on in people's lives and how we perceive things. So not to say that, um, to just like really kind of discount his experience or, you know, his, his story, but just saying like, you know, he, he does out like line some things that, you know, I've never really heard before. And so it's, it kind of took me back and I'm just like, Hmm, like what's going on here. So it definitely has stirred up some stuff in me of like, is this true? Is this not true? I don't know. Um, and so it's kind of like made me kind of do some like inner, inner thinking of like, how do I approach this now? <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, you're, if you're listening, you're probably going to feel that too um, towards like halfway through. So, so yeah. Um, a lot of people dismiss Robert as a conspiracy theorist. And I, I think that's a really cheap thing to say. It's like, oh, he doesn't have any value because he's a conspiracy theorist. I think that's um, not valid thinking. I think you'd have to really take each thing he says on its own merit. Like, do you think it's real or not? Like, could you go out and do some research and verify or, or, or not? Um, so I guess to be a little less vague, um, well, you'll hear a lot more about it in the show, but the, in short, um, he, he thinks a big part of the drug movement is um, kind of a plot from certain elements in involved in the CIA or elsewhere to erode America or the world, um, make it a little less democratic or, or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Like Huxley's vision is a real thing that certain groups are trying to put in place vision of brave new world. Um, it's a really tricky thing. Like I, I personally have been digging into conspiracy stuff for, close to 15 years, like probably since 2001, um, I started digging in deep. Like, what is this? What's real? How do we tell? Um, it's incredibly difficult. Um, at a certain point I had to say certain things, um, you know, you you have to like kind of grade the, the potential of it being true. It's like 10%, 50%. Like we just will never know like all those kind of things like might have to go in place. It's not just like a binary logic of, yes, this is true. Um, how do you, how do you vet people's individual stories? Um, all that kind of stuff is complicated. Like there's no doubt that the founder of the CIA, Alan Dulles had a lot of involvement with the Nazis. There's no doubt. There's also no doubt that he imported a lot of them over to the U S to work on scientific programs and, and to create spy networks. Like that's really well documented history. Um, it's also documented history that MK ultra happened and project artichoke happened. Like, and people were murdered. Like U S citizens were murdered as part of those programs and really bad shit was done to, um, American citizens by the American government murder. Like, you know, we all know about the Tuskegee experiments with syphilis and forced sterilization, but you know, take it a step further, fuck murder for real. <laughs> and it's documented. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, is he a Nazi? I don't know. Like, I don't think, I don't think it's clear evidence. There's clear evidence that he's a Nazi or he was a Nazi, but you know, he definitely had a lot of Nazi friends, um, till his, till his very later years. So that's kind of a rant there. Um, but you know, Robert, Robert, I think is highlighting the dark in order to like show that there are shades here. There are shadows here. Um, and in I think that's psychedelic subject. Yeah, and that, that's definitely important. Um, not everything is always love and light in the psychedelic community, and I think we have to like really um, 
take a moment and, and kind of reflect on, you know, some of these shadow aspects. It's real. Um, you know, I, I have a teacher that really talked about um, a lot of like the black magic and shamanism and, you know, that's that stuff's real. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's not always like a lot of love and light and healing. Um, and, you know, talk about like, you know, um, Robert kind of putting this idea out of drugs, being able to control societies and stuff like that. And, um, you know, you look at the opium trade, opium wars. I mean, that was definitely a way to kind of suppress uh, a society <laughs> in a sense. So it's like, you know, some of these ideas like aren't too far off of like, you know, what? why are psychedelics coming back and how could they be used possibly as a way to manipulate people or control people? Um, is that happening? I I don't think so. I don't, I don't feel that way. Um, it could be, you know, um, the, like the whole idea of Soma, right. Um, and Huxley's idea of like, it's what love will, de- what we love will destroy us. And I think like when we kind of get into that, it's like, yeah, we just get really kind of, um, entranced by these things. And then we stop questioning things. That's kind of, I think the point is, uh, like, as you know acid is a dollar to seven dollars a hit 14 hours or whatever the hell long it lasts feels like forever but you know you do that you go to some raves where you know i i like raves um some people think they're mindless but (laughs) you know you do that and like that becomes your whole world too um and you don't pay attention to anything happening politically ever um and you become like a hardcore consumer that's a pretty easy thing to manipulate. Like you as a hardcore consumer, super easy to manipulate. Um, all you want to do is post up new pics on Instagram and Facebook of you at these cool parties. And that's all you do. You don't care about, um, you know, oil and rubber industries in, in central South America. You don't care about the, the mineral slave trade f- to make your cell phone, um, rare mineral, rare earth minerals, I think they're called. Yeah. You know, and all you want to do is just party, 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 which is cool. But to be an engaged citizen on planet Earth, global citizen, I think is is worth something. Mm-hmm. To like take philosophy and politics kind of seriously is worth something. And if you're doing too much ecstasy or, or whatever, um, it might be hard for your critical faculties to to play into that. Um, it's it's okay to have a diversity of neural experiences. It's just, you know, what are you doing? What are you shooting for? What kind of life do you want? Do you want to contribute to having less people starve on planet Earth and, um, you know, mitigate the damage of global warming, all that kind of stuff? Um, and it's hard to do when you're doing drugs too often. You get wrapped up, like, let's figure out what DMT entities are. Um, <laughs> like, is that is that important or is that, should that be more of a hobby? <laughs> You know, a lot of people take it really seriously. Um, I mean, I took and, it pretty you know, seriously for a while. It's it's fascinating. It's hard not because, to, right? You know, you think about if you can understand that, maybe you'll figure out part of what this whole experience is, um, which has got me thinking a lot about um, the way I approach a lot of this stuff is just to remain open and curious um, because the the more I, I dig into it, the more I'm just like, I I don't know. Like who's, who's actually in control here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Right. So I, 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 I usually approach a lot of things, idea. I think with healthy skepticism now, um, by digging into the DMT entities for a long time and trying to figure out if that was real. Um, could have been, but right. how is it influencing my life at this point? I, I don't <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Like I, I, I spent a lot more time. Long. I spent a lot more time on the conspiracy stuff than on um, entities and, you know, aliens and stuff like that. Um, but it's enormous overlap. Like, who's to say those phenomena don't have some sort of conjunction, you know? I, I spent a lot of time on conspiracies, too. Um, and maybe this is getting into a rant. But, you know, I think it's also important to highlight this stuff for this talk. But, you know, when I was... When 9-11 happened, there, I, had a, I have a really strange experience with that. Somebody sending us an instant message, uh, like a message on AIM saying, like, we're going to attack your country in four days. And four days later, that happened. And this person gave us all these key codes. And he said, these numbers and key codes are going to be on the planes. You have the opportunity to save your world. 
I remember seeing my friend, he, he sent me all this, these conversations and I was reading it. And so when we found out what happened, we were in middle school, eighth grade, and we just stopped and looked at each other and we just started counting on our hands and we counted to four and we looked at each other and we're like, holy shit, what is going on here? I got really wrapped up in that stuff um, because of that experience. Like, how, how do you, what is that? <laughs> you know, um, somebody reached out to uh, the, my friend and pretty much kind of said, in four days, this is going to happen. Didn't say where, when, or we, you know, we thought it was a joke. But there's like, you know, some reports in that conspiracy world that people are reaching out and telling people that this was going to happen. And how do you make sense of that? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> So I guess let's kind of wrap this intro here. We can talk more on the other side, but yeah. So just so you're aware, um, <laughs> there's some stuff in here that might make you angry. There's some challenging stuff in here. Feel free to have those feelings. Maybe write us an email or write us on Facebook. Let us know what you're feeling about it. And we're happy to happy to have some dialogue. Um, I'm planning to have dialogue with Robert about it and uh, dig more into these ideas and, you know, see what, see what he's got. Like I, I, I think it's a valuable interview for us to have done. Um, I think the only other time we did an intro like this was with Dimitri Mijanis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because we were nervous. We're like, oh, shit. It's a crazy anarchist. <laughs> but, you know, it turned out to be one of my favorite episodes. I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Nobody cared. Um, so let us know what you think. Reach out. Psychedelics today. Email at gmail.com. You want to support us. Shoot us a review on iTunes. Um, share with your friends. And, uh, you know, maybe check out the Navigating Psychedelics class. We just put out a free copy uh, version, Navigating Psychedelics 101. Kyle put a lot of time into trimming out some stuff to put together a free offering. And maybe check that out. Get you and your friends safe. Um, You can find it all at psychedelicstoday.com. And uh, see you on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Robert Forte. Robert, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Nice to see you guys. So you have um, been involved in the psychedelic world for a very long time. You know most of the uh, most important figures in psychedelic history uh, from you know uh, working with them or being friends with them or otherwise. Uh, like we were just talking about Frank Barron, we were talking about um, Oscar Janiger. So you know, very very fascinating individual. A lot of connections and a lot of things to say um about the psychedelic world so thanks for finally joining us and i think we're going to have a really interesting conversation here yeah let's see where we go all right so um how i find it uh, a little difficult to describe you other than um you know tim's tim leary's archivist um and you're a friend of tim is that right that's kind of where i usually start when i describe you Uh, but i know there's so much more to it than that yeah, that's um, that's not really fair um, because although that's true, um, I knew Timothy Leary for quite a long time. Um, he wasn't my introduction to the field, and for uh, a great many years, I had an antagonistic relationship with him. You know, so just to you know back up for a second, I was born in 1956, so I was really uh, like a child of the 60s. My first uh, exposure to psychedelic drugs was was when I was, um, you know, 10, 11 years old, and they were starting to percolate into the community where I grew up in in northern New Jersey, for the most part, kind of affluent area. And I saw people uh, starting to take these drugs, uh, following Timothy Leary. And I my first impression uh, of psychedelic drugs was that they were dangerous and that they fucked people up. Mm. I, I saw the kids in my high school class who took them, you know, kind of went off into these uh, freaky dimensions. And I thought that they were a problem. And I vowed, I was a, I was a, I like to consider myself as sort of an athlete. And I was into health and uh, political activism and I, an anti war and pro environment. And I saw the psychedelic people mm. as being like too freaked out. Like what we needed to do was really like organize ourselves and go to school and get ourselves in positions of responsibility and authority in the culture. And psychedelic people were dropping out and taking drugs and going to weird concerts. And um, I thought it was a problem. And I, and, I, and I blamed Leary on that. 
And so um, I didn't take a serious interest in psychedelics until many years later when I was in my third year of college at Columbia University in New York, where I had become interested in the history of religion. And I learned that um, I learned I wanted to know who figured out meditation. How did how did ancient people come up with these simple and profoundly effective technologies for altering consciousness in a healing direction and making us more awake? And so uh, I began to study the history of religion, and that's where I first heard the name Gordon Wasson. Mm -hmm. And I learned that and I learned that uh, mushrooms were responsible for the origin of the whole the whole body of Indian mysticism originally. You can trace it back to these soma ceremonies that Wasson had identified as, as coming from the fire sacrifice and the Rig Veda and the mushroom. And a light went off in my head. Wow. All these years, I thought these were drugs that just deranged people. But here I see that there's a very important religious historical significance to them. And so I, I was a very thirsty student, and I went right down to the bookstore on Broadway and I picked up a few books, Alan Watts and Timothy Leary, and uh, looked at one of Wasson's books, and I just began to devour everything. And so you can see, like, just in the first you know, like, few years of my interest, there are these very radically different points of view. On the one hand, the drugs have a deranging effect on consciousness, and therefore on society. But on the other hand, they, have, they tie into these most profound sorts of spiritual transformations and awakening. And so my whole career really in psychedelic has been a kind of going back and forth between these two poles. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't reconnect with Tim until much later after um, spending a lot of time with people like Stan Groff, who was my first teacher, and Frank Barron, and Oz Janiger, and Gordon Wasson, and Albert Hoffman, and all of these people. See, I wanted to... Um, I wanted to learn everything I could about these substances. And, and back in these days, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was this lull. You know, like nobody was talking, no, there were a couple of books coming out, but if you tried to talk about this in the university, you were, you were ostracized. These were things that had been repressed. So I just went around, I took it upon myself to go, okay, well, Albert Hoffman. And I wrote Albert Hoffman a letter and I said, I want to be your student. And I, I organized a conference for him to come to and hung out with him for 10 days and we became friends. And that was my, that's what I, that's how I got started in it. That's a really wild, great way to get started. And I think it's really important to note that there are these different themes in psychedelics still today. You go to any dead show or fish show, you're going to see some people who don't look healthy. And we, we can be using these things you can still party and be healthy, people. <laughs> I think, and there's, but it's so easy to go overboard, um, and that's the, you know, one of the big things we need to watch for in this, you know, quote unquote party world, not necessarily the therapy world. I think that's a very important point that you make because it's it's really important. I find that as I'm coming out to speak more about this renaissance and things that are going on, not to polarize, like it's not. There's there's a lot going on here, and as you say, like you know, some of the the recreational use of psychedelic drugs. Well, recreation is a beautiful thing. You know, it's got a very key word in there, right? It's about recreative, right? There's nothing wrong with going to a concert, and dancing, and having ecstatic experiences, but there's a there is also a way that we that that you have to understand that. Um, that can also be uh, having a, a deranging influence on the society. And um, so it's very, it's very uh, tricky subject to take apart these different poles and, the, and look at it holistically. The way you phrased the, the point you made at the beginning of your statement around how, how you initially thought people just needed to go to good schools and get involved and try to make change, I think... Um, in some sense, we're seeing that, but I think at a lesser degree. But I, I, I do see that more people are trying to get engaged and less people are trying to just drop out totally, um, which is good. Maybe that's just you know Facebook activism, but who knows exactly um, what we're seeing? Because I, I don't know. Um, 
but very important stuff. It's very important stuff. And, um, you know, so I spent my first, I don't know, 20 years in this subject, very deeply involved in a lot of, a lot of things that we see now coming to fruition in terms of this renaissance. Like I said, when I took an interest in, in the late 1970s, early 80s, nothing was going on. And I, um, I was very lucky to become a student of Frank Barron. Now, Frank is another guy. I like to think he's sort of like me in that he had a very, very significant role in the first wave of psychedelia beginning in the 1950s. But hardly anyone has heard of him, right? Do you guys know who Frank Barron is and what his, what his influence was? I think only because of the articles you sent us a bunch of months ago um, when we were in correspondence a while back. Um, but yeah, creativity and personal freedom and creativity and psychological health being like two of his papers from the 60s. Those are you know, clearly subjects we want to pay attention to. But yeah, yeah nobody knows about this guy. Frank, could, well, Frank, you know, people think about the Harvard psilocybin project and they, you know, the media repeats, you know, this was something that Timothy Leary and Richard Albert, later Ramdas, started. Well, no, that's not true. Ramdas Ram Dass came in later. It was really started by Frank Barron. Frank Barron and Timothy Leary were best friends in graduate school and they were among... Um, quite a few social scientists in the 1950s who were politically sophisticated and realized what was happening to America during the Cold War, in the post, post-war period. And people now are all concerned about, oh no, we have Donald Trump and fascism is coming to America, we have to watch out. Well, fascism came to America a long time ago in the post-war period. And, and um, the, the kind of authoritarian personality, excessive conformity, irrational, pathological obedience to authorities, um, and, a, and a whole core of social scientists were very concerned about this. Frank Barron being one of them, Timothy Leary, the more famous ones maybe are people like Solomon Ash and Stanley Milgram and uh, Philip Zimbardo who did these important movies have been made recently about the later names that I've mentioned about how people were becoming just like Nazi Germany, inflicting harm on their, on their fellow students because an authority figure told them to, or conforming to a completely irrational, wrong point of view just because the group was doing it. Right. So Frank and Tim come up in this environment and they realize we have to do something about this. We have to address this rising current of fascism in America. And so Frank went into the study of creativity, recognizing that the difference between a fascist personality and a, and a creative or democratic personality has to do with their overall sense of self, their self-esteem, and the relationship of the self to nature. A fascist personality has got a, a very diminished self-esteem. They look outside of themselves for approval and recognition. So Frank became interested in the study of creativity, and this is where he discovered psychedelic drugs. Hmm. And he thought that this would be the holy grail of American psychology. This was the kind of thing that we could give to people that would activate this explosion of awareness inside and redirect the locus of authority from outer institutions and to, to the inner process. And it, could be, and it could bring about a great awakening. And this is, re this is really one of the very, very important beginnings of the modern psychedelic movement. Now, unless you have a question, let me just continue here with uh, um, what sure. I think is an important point. And, and one that I, I feel is I want to get this out now um, in, my, in when I speak. There's not one psychedelic, there's one family of drugs, okay? We know, you know, the drugs, the indoles, the phenethylamines, the tryptamines, all the psychedelic drugs, you know, that have been used historically and have these profound histories and effects. But there's more than one psychedelic movement. 
There's been a psychedelic movement of people like Frank Barron and Timothy Leary who saw these drugs and the revolutionary potential of them to transform American society in a democratic direction. There's also a psychedelic movement that uses these drugs in the complete opposite direction, that uses them in the service of fascism to bring about a totalitarian society. Now, that may seem odd, but let's back up a little bit and look overall at the history of religion, because religion is exactly the same way. Sometimes religion is a transformative force. Within, within the field of religion, we have you know, spiritual meditation techniques. We have uh, the golden rule. We have ethical systems. We have morality. All of these principles and um, the, the farther reaches of human nature, we can find disgust and teachings to bring them about in the field of religion. But also in the field of religion, we have the complete opposite. We have religion that's used as a political force to subjugate populations. As Marx famously said, you know, the, it's the opium of the masses. We have, we have quasi-fake religious principles uh, informing the Inquisition, informing Nazism, informing Zionism, informing nationalism, giving excuses for the... So the psychedelic movement is just a, a, a subject that's embedded in this and is a microcosm of this. And this is really important to, for people to understand because to a large extent, the modern psychedelic movement was started by fascists in order to derange American culture so that they could be more easily dominated. This is what Aldous Huxley first expressed in that most in his most one of his most important books, Brave New World. Hmm. Yeah, I mean the with the Brave New World, just giving somebody soma and just kind of yeah, just being okay with what's happening. But can you dig like unpack that a little bit more? Like how did this start off in that way? Yeah. I was can. it through Huxley or um Yes, it was actually through Huxley. See? And, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about my own personal shift in here, because when I first got into this subject and I, I organized a symposium at Harvard University in, in um, 1983. And um, again, my intention during these early years was to go around uh, working with Stan Groff at this time to go around and to um, contact the people who had done significant research in the first wave and and form a committee and we were we had intended to create an institute where we could do research into the effects of psychedelic drugs and so i went around to various places one of them was harvard and i brought together a number of the people that were still in the cambridge community and i went and was hanging out with richard schultes and um and schultes said well why don't you uh, invite gordon wasson now, Wasson was like, to me, it was like Moses or something, you know, like I didn't think he would be approachable. And um, Schultes just said, well, here, call him up. And he had this, I never forget, he had an old, had an old dial phone and uh, picked up the phone and called Gordon. And the next thing I knew, I was at Gordon's house. I borrowed a, a suit from my father and, um, and I borrowed his Lincoln Continental so he wouldn't think I was a hippie radical or anything. And I drove to his very... Um, you know, beautiful home in Danbury, Connecticut, and connected with the guy. And I, to me, you know, it's like, oh my God, what an honor. I felt so special. And here I was in this guy's home and he was inviting me to live with him. It was during the last year of his life. He wanted me to help him uh, organize his massive archives. And so it was a very special uh, teacher-student relationship for me at the time. And, um, and I became friends with the family they gave me the copyrights to his books. I started to come out with new editions of his very important books on the role of the mushroom in ancient religions. And then I came to a very disturbing discovery about Gordon Wasson several years after he died. When I was in his archives at Harvard, they, I mean, Harvard gave me a corner office in the herbaria, a secretary bringing me out trays of with slides and materials from his archives. And I was like a kid in a candy store. 
I was so fascinated by everything. And um, I wandered off his mushroom studies and began to look at his uh, personal correspondence and other things about his life. And so <clears throat> at this point, we knew Gordon Wasson was a Wall Street banker, right? It was a kind of irony in psychedelic history that, that, the, that the rediscovery of the mushroom would come to a man who was a Wall Street banker. Like, what's that? That what a weird little thing that was, you know, like the opposite of the psychedelic movement is a Wall Street banker. Well, I found out that Gordon Wasson, although, you know, it's kind of technically correct to say he was a Wall Street banker. When we think banker, we think of someone that's doing pension funds or interest rates or, you know, stocks and things. Well, it's true he worked for J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan is technically a bank, but but J.P. Morgan was a lot more than a bank. I mean, J.P. Morgan was a political force in the United States, not a democratic political force. J.P. Morgan was a, was a major supporter of the Third Reich. J.P. Morgan was behind um, a, a nearly successful military coup d'etat to remove Franklin Roosevelt from the presidency in 1934. You know, I can see your expression there, Jill. Let's see. A lot of my critique really comes from a, a very solid background in American history, and a lot of these things will seem like wacky, but you got to, you know, and, and, uh, and I don't want to get too professorial here. I know this is just a podcast, but there are references, and everything that I'm saying is true. So I began to look into Wasson's. Wasson wasn't just a banker. Wasson was... He wasn't really dealing with money per se. Wasson was into PR. He was a PR, he was a propagandist for one of the most uh, anti democratic political forces in the United States at the time, JP Morgan. Okay? And his close friends, his closest friends were people like Alan Dulles. Okay, now when I saw, I saw the, you know, Alan Dulles correspondence. And now, who's that? Well, Alan Dulles was one of the original directors of the CIA. He was a banker for Adolf Hitler and Third Reich. He was the he was the director of the CIA when MK Ultra got started. He was probably the the principal person responsible for the assassination and cover up of President John Kennedy. He's a total motherfucker, and. Um, and, you know, don't just take my word for it. Read the, read the very brilliant book that uh, came out a few years ago by David Talbot, The Devil's Chessboard, and, um, and begin to Google around, you know, whoever's going to listen to this stuff and really get a sense of who Alan Dulles was and to understand the origins of the American CIA. You know, and this is another, this gets into some very dark stuff, which I had become quite familiar with in my in my years as a scholar. And so uh, that kind of struck me. So here's Wasson, not exactly a banker. He's a strategist for, for the American fascist movement in the post-war period. That kind of struck me. And looking again at his letters, George Kennan, who was the architect of the Cold War and one of the principal operatives in what's known as Project Paperclip, which is the importation of thousands of Nazis into the United States into positions of authority in publishing, banking, um, science, aerospace. You know, like what happened in the post-war period is, uh, is a very dark and, and uh, important chapter to, for, Amer for students in American history to really understand and, and to see like how we got to where we are now. It wasn't Trump. And this stuff happened way back in the 50s. And Wasson was right there in the middle of it. So that kind of set me off like, huh, that's strange. So that's one thing. And, um, and then a few years after that, okay, so the first thing that really kicks off the American psychedelic movement, one of the most important events is, of course, Wasson's publication in Life magazine of his expedition to Mexico where he encounters Maria Sabina and becomes the first white guy 
to have to take part in a velada and writes about it in Life magazine, which is the most popular periodical in America at the time. This mushroom, with these very profound effects as we all know and love, had hitherto been known only by a handful of anthropologists of Mesoamerican culture, is suddenly now it published in this very sensational article in the most popular magazine in America. I was shown documents um, about 10 or 15, uh, 12 or so years ago, whatever, that this, that this expedition, this publication of this expedition, that Wasson article, was part of MK Ultra. Okay? Maybe we should back up and say a little bit what MK Ultra is, but this was a CIA op. Wasson, and I took this, when I saw this document, I was kind of offended because, um, as you may or may not know, I conducted a, a very thorough interview with Gordon Wasson about his career. Uh, he only gave a couple of interviews in his whole life. Like I said, I had access to him, I felt special. And I sat down with him one day in a tape recorder, and we talked about his whole career. And it's a very important piece. It's published in my first book, Entheogens and the Future of Religion. And we talked about the CIA in that book. And he told me that the CIA secretly infiltrated his mission. And that's not true. The CIA did not secretly infiltrate his mission. Wasson was working hand in glove with the CIA for a long period of time. This was a deliberate operation. And so I've been asking myself, and I ask you, and I think everybody needs to ask this question, why would the Third Reich, basically that's how we can say what the CIA is, right? It's a continuation of the Third Reich. Why would they want to introduce the psychedelic mushroom into American society. How does that serve them? So as I ponder that question, this is getting to your question, Kyle, is it, because Wasson was close with Huxley, right? And um, why would they do this? Well, Huxley's very explicit about the goals, the intentions of what he calls world controllers and how to bring about a totalitarian society without anybody really noticing that that's what you're doing. And so there, the, he taught, I mean, Brave New World is one thing, but an even more telling document is what Huxley wrote in 1958, which is Brave New World Revisited. You know this document? It's, it's um, I, you know, I recommend it to my students and to people and the you know, people really want to think critically and intelligently about the psychedelic renaissance. You have to read Brave New World Revisited, which is published in 1958. It's an essay. It's not a novel. It's a postscript, but it's, but it's, uh, but it's uh, Huxley basically saying, wow, I had no idea it was really going to happen this fast. And these techniques of the world controllers have become much more sophisticated and much more effective. And he writes about, you know, the, the advent of these new psychedelic drugs and how this is the new soma. And it's like, it's like having the image that I get, it's like throwing fairy dust in the eyes of a population. So they become so mesmerized and so enthralled with mysteries and psychological process and less attentive. They'll be also become more trusting and more suggestible and more beautiful. I mean, people that take psychedelic drugs, we, we in effect become more beautiful. We become more creative. We become more turned on. But we are also distracted. And this is, you know, this, I know a lot of these things I say uh, are offensive to those of us that love these drugs, that, we, that we've been tricked to a certain extent. But this is, this is what's kind of on the table, and I think that we have to digest. Go ahead and ask me another question. Really briefly, I'll let Kyle kind of add on to what I say here. But um, 
we we talk quite often about how there's a lot of cult like activity in the psychedelic world, extreme lack of critical thinking, and um, I forget where we got this line the other day. Um, let's not confuse um, being ungrounded for enlightenment. And I think that's you know a very common thing in the psychedelic world. You feel ungrounded, but you mistake it for enlightenment, and as a result, start making all sorts of crazy mistakes. Um, and uh, briefly, I, I'll say that um, I've been kind of a student of CIA misbehavior for a long time, and um, I never exactly extrapolated it to being an extension of the Third Reich, but I never really equivocated the CIA to doing good work ever. Like everything I've really read has been fairly horrific. Um, I've, I've, I'm, not, I'm not aware of anything other than stealing secrets from the Russians that I was okay with, but even that's kind of a fabrication. Um, Kyle, if you want to add on, or Robert, if you want to jump in. Well, I don't want to go too far into this, but I, but I encourage a serious, courageous student to look more carefully into the origins of the CIA and look at the individuals who created it and what their backgrounds were and, you know, look at things like, I don't know, um, Reinhard Galen. Okay, so Reinhard Galen and Theodore Shackley, who became the, um, you know, Reinhard Galen was the chief of uh, intelligence for the Third Reich. Mm. And he's one of these guys who defected before the supposed end of the war and created the... the um, uh, covert operations aspects of the CIA and train this guy Theodore Shackley. And so what the, you know, now a lot of the, 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 mis, the misadventures of um, uh, U.S. interference in Latin American affairs, that, you know, a lot of people don't even know about. A lot of this is the Galen Project. Henry Kissinger, this is where Henry Kissinger comes from, okay? Uh, so... <clears throat> Um, you know, and then the CIA starts MK Ultra, which is from the German people. Like, what is what does MK Ultra stand for? Well, it stands for Mind Control, Control with a K, like the German Mind Control Ultra, Ultra Mind Control. And in this post-war period, see the battlefield shifts. The Third Reich didn't give up their agenda of world domination. They, need, they, needed to, they needed to control the American population so that it in, wouldn't, you know, the American spirit was not a global empire sort of spirit. It was an isolationist. It was take care of yourself kind of spirit. And um, there was a major shift in American ideology during these, starting in the, you know, in the, in the 30s. Another really important character in this, operation is Henry Luce, okay? Henry Luce was the publisher, editor-publisher, and ruled the whole Time Life media empire with an iron fist. He was another guy like J.P. Morgan, who was a fascist. He thought that the super elite needed to control the world, that, we, that they had the responsibility and the you know, know-how, and they were, anti, they were opposed to democracy. And so the, the media empire is a propaganda ministry to begin to reintroduce and redefine the American spirit. This is where <clears throat> he starts hyping this idea of American exceptionalism. You know, that America, we have an obligation to dominate the world, to police the world, because we have this, you know, free enterprise and we have democracy and we have all these rights and privileges and we need to we need to police the world and so I wrote these articles about you know americana and giving the sort of the very much like christianity very much like <clears throat> using christianity to justify the inquisition right so spanish conquistadors went all over saying well you know this is you know going to beat back these savages so we can save their souls. That kind of shifted here in the 30s and 40s into American exceptionalism. And Henry Luce, skull and bones guy, close friend of Wasson's, 
he did more to publicize psychedelic drugs than anybody. And I'm going to tell you another important book that's, that's part of this kind of critical view, really important book that psychedelic people just don't want to look at or address, but I, it's, by, it's called Acid Hype, hmm. um, uh, uh, the Psychedelic Experience and the American News Media. And it's a scholarly treatment by Stephen Siff from the University of Wisconsin, I believe, um, about how psychedelic drugs were first promoted into American society beginning in the late 50s through the Henry Luce media empire. So the same guy that has Adolf Hitler as man of the year, Time magazine a couple times and Mussolini is also putting these drugs out there and getting people all excited about them. So this, this is really important that we understand that this was not at the beginning, a peace and love, higher consciousness movement. It's a psyop along the lines of Huxley. That's what, that's what, that's the way it seems to me. Hmm. Yeah, this is, um, a really interesting piece of history. Um, a few things uh, came up for me, um, maybe going back to Watson and whatnot. You said that you had some documents stating like he was um, connected with the CIA and you, you found it out through that, not through the interview, but some other document. Um, so I was wondering, A, like, do you have a reference for that or is that available anywhere? Um, and then I, you know, also this idea <clears throat> that psychedelics could be introduced and used as this way to control people. And I'm coming back to like Huxley and um, George Orwell. And um, when I was in my undergrad, we were doing kind of this analysis of Brave New World versus uh, 1984. And it kind of like came to the conclusion that like Orwell kind of promoted like this fear. It's like the fear is going to destroy us. Big Brother is going to, you know, watch over us. And it's like, you know, everything's watching us. We're, we're afraid of it versus like Huxley. It's like what we love will end up destroying us because we just don't really care. We're just kind of like really, yeah, so interested in it and so, and so enthralled by it. Um, so, you know, it, when I think about that, it's not so far off. I mean, you could even think about it with our technology with, with like a phone. We're just so caught up in it all the time. Maybe we're not really taking action. Maybe we're just so distracted by media and all this entertainment, you know, and, and psychedelics and this piece of technology. It's all, we, we love it and we could get really distracted by actually not taking action. But, um, yeah. So I guess like, do you have any of these other documents that, you, that you've suggested or are they floating around anywhere that we could kind of like check in on that and kind of do our own research? Yeah, it's, a, it's um, you know, a lot of the um, MKUltra documents were destroyed. They, they were they were kind of found out and, and like 75 percent of the MKUltra documents were destroyed. But some of them remain. And um, the first per- there's a little problem here. The first person to find this, so the, the Wasson expedition that I'm talking about is MK Ultra subproject number 58. And um, I could send you the documents. I, I think if you Google them now, you can find them. But I have to point out a certain problem in this, in that... Um, There was a young man who approached me in the, about 12 years ago, whose name is Jan Irvin. Mm. And he was um, a very angry person. And he called me, he read my book, he wanted me to, he wanted to interview me. He was very passionate about psychedelics, but he was very angry and a very difficult character. And I didn't like his tone. And so I brushed him off, but he was very persistent. And I finally, he got me to read his book. He wrote a book called The Holy Mushroom, which is about Wasson's interference with John Allegro's research. And I found the book to be quite excellent. And Mm -hmm. I, I knew that Wasson had a certain relationship with Allegro and I didn't quite understand. And I read Irvin's book. And I thought it was excellent. And so I decided to engage him in some discourse. 
And he was the first one to point out to me these MK Ultra subproject 58 documents. And, um, and these are basically the pay requisitions from the CIA uh, describing the funds released for the photo equipment for the expedition. It was done through a front organization, the Geschechter Fund, um, that it was, you know, all the publication to me indicates that they had intended to publish this stuff, you know, the photography and the recording equipment. And, um, and so I'm mentioning this part because over the years, Jan has um, established his own podcast and um, put out a great deal of material. But he is such a difficult character. I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get, I, I don't even, he thinks I am in the CIA. He's, he's made some sweeping, very insulting comments about a lot of people. Um, he's alienated serious scholars from getting into this sort of inquiry. Um, but he has also, years ago, he teamed up with a scholar named Joseph Atwill, who has become a very good friend of mine and a scholar who I respect enormously. So there's a paper that Jan and Joe wrote together that's really quite good. And so it's just a little awkward here because I want to, I want to, I've always tried to encourage him, but he's such a difficult personality that I, I realize it's just not going to be possible. And so to somehow rescue the ideas that Joe Atwill, Colin Ross is another, um, a psychiatrist, a very solid guy whose name you should jot down. He's written, he writes a lot about um, psychedelics and MK Ultra, and he's the original source. He's the one who found this document through a freedom of information uh, request. And so, um, you know, it's really unfortunate because when I give, when I, and I'm starting to speak more often, you know, people say, oh, that Jan Irvin stuff. Well, see, that's what I'm talking about. They, like, you even have to wonder if Irvin is a, a deliberate character to poison the water of this important sort of inquiry. So I, so, um, but yes, the documents are available and if you can't find them, I'll send you my copies. Yeah. I used to love Irvin's work and then it just deteriorated, um, for whatever reason, he just kind of went wildly downhill at, uh, over a course of like a year. I was like, oh, that's a yeah. real bummer. Cause I loved him for a while. <laughs> It was uh, yeah, no, I tragic. Know him. Yeah, it's tragic and it's uh, a puzzle. And I've tried many times to support his work and help to, you know, massage his difficult personality. I don't want to say personal things about him because I do. Resp I, I certainly can empathize with his anger because there are millions of people who have been misled by this overhyped propaganda of psychedelics who have developed kind of messianic inflationary syndromes and um it's a very very serious problem that we have to face in our culture and um it's a real shadow and so we have to do this with delicacy and intelligence so let's kind of talk about that so obviously this whole thing started um probably slightly before mk ultra was kicked in but we don't really have firm you know all that much data on it. we have a lot of data on mk ultra but we don't have everything so like obviously there was really serious research put into this all over the world to figure out how to manipulate people, you know, however you want to phrase that. And then, um, you know, truth serum or, you know, Jason Bourne style stuff or whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, but doctors got their hands on it and said, what good can we do? Right. Like folks like Groff, um, got their hands on it and they were really helping folks. Um, so there are like two sides of this coin, right? And then, you know, yes. what we're seeing now in a lot of festival culture or, or just culture, psychedelic cult, quote unquote culture, it's not really much of a culture or community, but there's there seems to be this kind of um, set of people who are just hardcore fixed on doing as much as they can as regularly as they can and not slowing down and reflecting, maybe reading some books to see what other bright minds have said on the subject. and. Um, is that kind of what you're saying? Like it, it kind of takes them out of the political game when they get so wrapped up in the LSD thing. Is that kind of what you're trying to say or is it more yeah. complex than that? 
Yeah, well, it's complex, but that's a good, you know, it's a long conversation and that's a good way to, to begin it. Yes. Let me just say something that the use of, and you probably know this, but the use of drugs to control populations is the oldest trick in the book. It goes way back. Okay. And a, another book that I recommend to students is a very fine book by a guy named John Potash, P-O-T-A-S-H. You ought to interview him as well. He came out with a book a few years ago called Drugs as Weapons Against Us. Okay. Now, the problem with that book is that he does not allow what you just mentioned, Joe, that there are positive uses of these drugs. He thinks that they're all poison, but, he's, but it's, a, it's a very good book. Like, for example, Skull and Bones, right? We all know about this, this notorious fraternity at Yale, which is where the CIA comes from, and it has its roots back in, uh, well, you know, where did Skull and Bones come from? Well, Skull and Bones comes from opium traffickers. That's where the fortune came from, from I believe it's the Russell Trust. They made their fortune controlling the opium trade. Okay? And they're very significantly involved in this whole psychedelic movement since the 50s. Okay? So Drugs as Weapons Against Us, that's a good book. Now, now, now let's shift in a little bit to what you're mentioning, these positive aspects of the psychedelic drugs. Because even though the CIA was largely responsible for uh, funding a lot of the research that went on in the 50s and 60s, including Timothy Leary's, does not mean that everybody that's paid by the CIA is a CIA, a conscious CIA asset, or doing things what the CIA wanted them to do. I mean, when I spoke with Timothy Leary about this, you know, he said... You know, you have to understand, Robert, that back in those days, we didn't realize the CIA was all bad. And there were ways to take this, the power of these drugs and use them to subvert the, the, the fascists. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a screenplay right now, and it's like, you know, I look at the 1960s as a period of chemical warfare in the United States with both sides using the same drugs, but with different means, with different set and settings. You've got this, and, and not, it's mostly about Leary. Hmm. But if you notice Leary's life, Leary, you know, look at the difference say, between Leary, Kesey, and Huxley. Okay, so Huxley's saying, Let's, let's administer these drugs to the society through the psychiatric profession, through the elites, through the institutions. And, and when that happens, the elites and the institutions are really being empowered. It, it exerts a very conservative influence. Kesey is not, doesn't have any kind of political. Kesey is just saying, let's just get all fucked up and freak out. And, <laughs> like an apolitical message. But Leary, Tim was, was, was unique and distinctive because he, he, was a, he believed in, in democracy. He was a humanist. He wanted to equalize wealth. He didn't just say, take these drugs. He said, take these drugs and question authority. Use these drugs to create your own reality. Tim, wasn't, Tim went, like, had a reckless hedonistic side, but this guy was a scholar, a social scientist, a, cl a brilliant clinician, mm. he had a spirit about him, and he differentiated himself from the rest of all of these psychedelic authorities, and they all hated him. You know, they all like, oh, Tim is the guy that blew it. Well, he blew it for the institutions, but he wanted to release them into the masses to shift, as I said earlier, this locus of authority to empower individuals, to question authority and to, and to, and to stop this militaristic, you know, fascism that was beginning to dominate our world. And that's why all of these characters in the 1960s psychedelic movement, Tim was the only one who suffered legal consequences. You know, he spent years of his life, you know, dodging jail, was in prison for seven years, probably tortured in prison, 
You know, that's that's the mark of a, of a real philosopher. So, yeah, after reading a number of books about Tim, um, I'm starting to see that he just, you know, I guess he antagonized a lot of people somehow, yeah. but he just had this pure, what seemed like for, for most of his life, a pure heart and a pure spirit. The hedonism, I think, is fine. I'm not I'm pro-hedonism. But, um, yeah, it, it's just interesting how they were able to lay all this shit on him and make him out to be the most evil man in the world. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And especially now, if you look, if you guys read this new book by Michael Pollan. Yeah, Pollan was pretty unfair. Um, yeah. Zach called him out on that, thankfully, on his podcast. You know, I haven't listened to that podcast yet, but I did, probably didn't call him out. I, I did chide Zach a little bit, who's a good friend of mine. Um, you know, Zach is in this funny position with maps, which is... Um, you know, another thing maybe we want to talk about a little bit. I don't know. That's like, but uh, yeah, Pollen's a company man. I mean, Pollen is um, you know, staff writer for the New York Times and, and, and uh, Harvard and Berkeley professor. And he's now, you know, um, not with this book that is putting forth a narrative that I think is um, misleading and deliberate to try to put psychedelics back into the soma category and make us mm. so um kyle are you good to go into the map subject sure i mean i was gonna ask what do you think about this new resurgence and and psychedelics and um yeah what are some of your thoughts on the medical model and pushing for legalization um you know obviously it'd be great to be able to treat people with ptsd and um you know end of life anxiety and, and all this stuff but there is also some strange things floating around with this um or you know conversations and you know it's not just with maps it's also with another company or organization compass pathways with their whole psilocybin thing you know just this idea of kind of yeah, I don't know, ca maybe capitalizing off of the medical model. <laughs> or how do you like to approach this, Robert? We'll put it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, one way to look at it, see what happened, let's see. What happened with LSD in the 50s and 60s and 70s is a, is a kind of recapitulation of what happened I'm sorry, what happened with MDMA is a recapitulation of what happened with LSD. Okay, so here's this drug that is discovered or invented, and um, it's put out into the society in order to cause chaos. Some people find out that it actually has really powerful beneficial properties and so the drug is made illegal. So these really powerful potentialities of the drug become thwarted. Responsible physicians and good-hearted healers are excluded from using this drug. And the drug can only be used, can only be controlled by the underground, by the CIA. Okay? This is what we saw with heroin, too. Right? Heroin, is made, heroin has got important medical applications. When it's made illegal, it becomes you know, a, a horrible menace to the inner cities. And of course, that very important book by Alfred McCoy, The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, about how that's all controlled by the CIA. It has political and economic reasons for doing that. It, it fucks up the cities. It makes huge profits for the CIA. Same with LSD. Now, let's shift into the 1980s and MDMA and the creation of maps. And this is something that I was quite involved with. I, I was given my first MDMA in um, 1981 um, by, um, through an associate of Timothy Leary's. I was amazed. Wow. 
what a great drug this is. This is the perfect drug to reintroduce the field of psychedelics. It's a moderate, intermediate, altered state of consciousness. Your, the, the unconscious and the mysteries of the human spirit don't get thrust upon you. You're invited into them. It can empower the... There were so many incredible applications of MDMA that I decided to devote my life to it. As typical of my ways back then, Tim told me that the guy that really uh, you needed to talk to about MDMA was Alexander Shulgin. And so I hitchhiked up to Berkeley from Big Sur. I was living at Esalen. Hitchhiked up to Berkeley and walked into Alexander Shulgin's office. He was teaching at Berkeley. And I introduced myself as a young man that wanted to understand psychedelics. And I had MDMA. And wow, what a great drug. Could I get some more from you? <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed and he said, oh, no, I couldn't do that. And we chatted for about an hour or so, and I told him where I was coming from. And, and he said, but I can teach you how to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, that's terrific. So within, within a, a short while, I had gotten some chemists together for the University of California, PhDs, and we set up a lab up here on the campus, and we started to produce MDMA. And I began to go about turning people on to it. Now, the deal was, this is not an illegal drug, and we want to keep it that way. So this is secret. I'm going to give you this drug. I'm going to ask you to write down what happens to you. Use it with someone you love. Candlelight. Secret. You're going to love it. And so this is where Rick Doblin gets his first MDMA. And Rick... Of all the hundreds and hundreds of people that were part of this three or four year long project, Rick didn't keep the secret. Rick, who was a, a brash and, you know, kind of charming college dropout at the time, and he was, to my mind, you know, exactly the problem that we were going to try to avoid in the reintroduction of psychedelic drugs in our society. It's just kind of hedonistic, you know, partying sort of atmosphere. I know that now the history is that Rick said he always wanted to be a psychedelic psychotherapist. So Rick didn't keep the secret. Rick calls the government. We had, we had said, I wasn't the only MDMA chemist in Northern California. I wasn't actually the chemist. I was just sort of the one who organized the project. There were many of us. There were several different labs around and a great many psychotherapists in the Northern California area orbiting out of Esalen who were using MDMA in secret with really great effects. Okay, Rick Doblin takes it on himself to call Ronald Reagan's drug czar, Carlton Turner. He calls the media. He basically snitches us all out, calls the government and says, there's a new drug going on in Northern California, this love drug. Oh, my God, it is so fantastic. All these it starts out of the Esalen Institute. He pissed everybody off. I had been working on this project, organizing psychedelic researchers. It was all top secret. We thought this was going to be a great opportunity to reintroduce psychedelics into the culture in this moment of calm, but Rick and helps create this whole big sensation around MDMA. And, and by doing this, he positions himself, he ingratiates himself to the government and becomes the poster boy for MDMA. And then, see, and, that, and I, I turned on a bunch of people in this time. Rick, Rick was one of them. But I also turned on the president of the American Psychiatric Association, people at the Harvard Medical School, at the University of Chicago Medical School, um, and one particular guy named Charles Schuster, who became the head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And what we saw almost overnight was MDMA going from this secret drug used by clinicians with fantastic results to it becoming the most popular recreational drug in the world. 
It went from a secret thing with little labs all over the place to a huge thing controlled by the Israeli mafia, making billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars over the next couple of decades. The therapeutic effects of the drug are completely, almost completely squandered. It becomes a huge cash cow for the underground Israeli mafia, mostly, and you can Google this. It's like cocaine and heroin are the province of the CIA. MDMA is a Mossad operation. Okay, Google that. You can find important things written about it. And this, and this phenomena of the rave scene starts to happen. Whereas like almost overnight, there's things like big warehouses all over the, all over the world and thousands of kids tripping on this MDMA stuff and, and, and all these adulterants. And instead of it being a drug that really empowered the individual and brought about these experiences of intimacy with yourself and one another, this mind-numbing music and kids just frying their brains on this, you know, this like monotonous, crazy, enchant this, this uh, you know, and this, and like, oh, every, and then the memes change, you know, like a Leary's meme of the 1960s, question authority, think for yourselves. The meme in the, in the, in the 90s is, it's all good. It's all good. I mean, that's, so what's happening, what I'm telling you is happening, is that this is the soma. This is soma being released to the masses, just making everybody feel like everything is okay. When everything is not okay, <laughs> And so um, Rick, and then Rick made a whole career of himself. Rick is basically a government agent. MAPS is basically a government agency that's trying to validate a prohibitionist model. It blows my mind how successful he has been and how uncritical so many people are, like from the psychedelic community, throwing money at MAPS. So researchers can do research with MDMA. He doesn't do a damn thing for the overall psychedelic community. When Rick is successful having his so-called nonprofit corporation charging $12,000, that's what they expect it's going to cost, $12,000 for four or five MDMA sessions, it's still going to be illegal for you, Joe. It's still going to be illegal for me. Kyle, if you get caught with MDMA, unless you've paid Rick Doblin and these government agencies, he is certified MDMA therapist. It's, going to, it's a prohibition model, right? It's monopolistic, and we are aware of that and talking about that pretty often because they, can... they are going to be the only ones that have that license, and that, that really, to me, sucks. That's not... It's good that somebody's doing research. It's not good that there's multiple monopolies out there. Yeah. Um, and that's what's going on. That's been the plan since the beginning for him. Right. In, co in cooperation with the government. You know, like, Rick, we'll, we'll let you do your thing. You can raise your money. You'll make it seem like we have a legitimate scientific process going on. The Israelis will continue to make billions of dollars tax-free from these drugs and fund their covert operations, just like intelligence agencies have done since the Roman Empire, and um, somehow pretend that you're really a champion for individual freedom. It's hilarious, in a way. So there was a comment a while ago, I think I caught you make on a lecture, um, no, it was some YouTube lecture, you've, you've probably seen it. Um, it was something about like being opposed to um, full legalization. Um, was did you ever make? Are you familiar with that, that kind of critique? I never watch my YouTube lectures. I okay. wish they weren't on there. But um, <laughs> no, I'm 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 definitely in favor of complete legalization. But but let's make sure that it's really legalization. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I believe. I mean, I be, like like um, basil is legal. <laughs> People think people think that we just had a, a legalization of, of cannabis right. passed here in California. Cal cannabis is more illegal now in California than it was ten years ago. You know, there are more rules, there are more there are people are getting busted. <clears throat> legal means 
like what it says in the Bill of Rights, that Congress can Congress should have nothing to do. The government should have nothing to do with what individuals do in the privacy of their own home. That's legal. You know, and you trust right. you trust in the common sense of people, you know, and um, I don't know. You may, just made me think since you're out there in Colorado. <laughs> when my, my we can only have six plants per person, which is yeah, like, right. oh, thank you, government. I really appreciate that. I <laughs> Six plants is nothing because <clears throat> because the real subversive power of cannabis comes from eating fresh, raw cannabis. That, I mean, we talk about its psychoactive thing, but the real threat of cannabis is the threat that it presents to the pharmaceutical industry when they find out what a great anti-inflammatory, neuroprotector, and anti-cancer drug it is. But you need to grow lots of it. So fresh, raw cannabis, you say, is yes. a good thing to try? Oh, definitely. I'll try it out. Yeah. <laughs> I finally oh, have my I've, I've, I've heard good things about it. People juice it and stuff like that. Yeah. You know. No, the real power, the real, the real um, philosopher's stone of cannabis is the THCA, the non-psychoactive. Unpyrolyzed, huh? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a whole other thing. But so, um, so MAPS is um, a government agency that's tricking people into thinking it's, um, it's for the people. It's a corporate strategy where a very small number of people benefit profoundly while the, while the rest of the population is sort of subservient to their and their and their relationship to the government. It's kind of psychedelic oligarchy that's being created. Well, so I'm sure people listening are probably like, whoa, what's going on here? Or maybe this is the first time they've heard <laughs> of something like this before and it might be rubbing them the wrong way. I don't know. Um would there be another model of like trying to get MDMA or psychedelics uh, quote unquote legalized for therapeutic use or just for like medicines for people that are suffering? Because, you know, there's a lot of people that listen to our show that are, you know, probably therapists or people that want to get involved in this. And this is probably like, a, whoa, this, is, this well, is a lot. And, you know, yeah. the work that MAPS has been doing has been really like hopeful for a lot of people that, hey, this might be the future of psychiatry and psychology. And, yeah, well, I think there are several models that have been much more effective than MAPS. I mean, here's MAPS going on for what, you know, 30 something years. He's raised millions and millions of dollars. He gets supported by some of the, you know, like the Mercer Foundation and other and other defense contractors and fortunes from that have, you know, well-known allegiance to the military industrial state. Um, much more effective model, for example, one that um, sparked just a few miles from where I live in Northern California when we first passed the California um, Medical Marijuana Initiative back in, I think it was 1986. And, and, um, and that sparked movements all over the country where millions of people, until there was a, a, a reaction from the establishment, millions of people could use cannabis for their own medical use. So there's, 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 you know, what MAPS basically does is it's an authoritarian model where you, you respect the authority of the government of the Controlled Substance Act and you try, to, you try to, you know, kiss their ass enough to get their permission. The other way, the more American way, is in voter-mandated voter reforms. So I understand in Colorado you're coming up with a with a, a possibility where voters are going to say, you know what, you know, we have a right to die. So why don't we have a right to use psilocybin? Yeah. You know, yeah. see, this is the important thing here is the shift of authority. Where's the authority mm. right now? Federally, the authority is in the controlled substance act of 1970. It's a completely, it's a completely bogus bullshit piece of legislation that was thrown into place in a direct response to Timothy Leary. See what Timothy Leary did. Timothy Leary was busted with a little bit of pot in 1966, and they tried to put him in jail for 20 years. And he said, fuck you. I'm taking this to the Supreme Court. And by golly, he did, and he won. And so Nixon came back and created this law that puts all these drugs into these schedules. Not only does it put these drugs into these schedules, but it gives the authority to determine 
a drug's medical or scientific use to the DEA. It creates the DEA and it gives the police the authority, not doctors, not judges, not educators, not scientists, police. And so what needs to be done is the law needs to be changed through an act of Congress. Now you think that's, oh my God, how are we going to get an act of Congress? But here's my other favorite example of much more effective drug policy reform than MAPS is one of my favorite little books by one of my greatest teachers, Houston Smith, mm. called One Nation Under God, but written by Houston Smith and Reuben Snake. And it describes how the Native American church got an act of Congress to overturn a Supreme Court decision that returned their right to use peyote. Now, if a bunch of Native Americans can do it, why can't educated white Americans turn around and say this Controlled Substance Act, either through voter-mandated reforms or a court case, to show that, especially now, so like Joe, if you got busted with some MDMA you, the, federally, they would be saying, okay, so you're in possession of a Schedule One drug. That means it's a drug that has no medical use and a high potential for abuse. That's the law. But that law is completely false. Look at the medical use. The government is paying this guy a million dollars to use it medically. That law doesn't make sense. I right? had a friend recently get busted with some mushrooms, and uh, it was very interesting to watch how it played out. The court was going to be um, the DA. The DA is super asshole. I, I really dislike this guy. But he, um, <laughs> unbelievable, he was trying to put murder charges on people for drug offenses. I'm like, you are kidding me? Um, but anyway, my friend got um, to court, and um, <laughs> they, when they went to sentencing, they all went back into the back room to like do some research. What should we give this guy? And they were like, oh, like, look, this drug is actually like not harmful at all. And in fact, a lot of research is happening to prove that it's helpful. It's just a, a fascinating kind of reversal happening in courtrooms. So I think yeah. we as citizens have to understand the the police are different from the courts sometimes, not always, but um, right. it's right. something to pay attention to. This is exactly right. I've worked on several court cases with a, a famous attorney in San Francisco, Tony Serra, where we came up with a list of affidavits that shows that psilocybin is wrongly classified. It has medical use. It has very low potential for abuse. When MDMA, I, I worked when MDMA, when they made that illegal, we had hearings across the whole country. And the, the, the DEA's judge recommended that it be in Schedule 3. It has medical use and a low potential for abuse. But again, because of the law, the DEA has the power to overrule the judge. The judge is just there as a figurehead to mm. make it seem like it's democracy. But it's not democracy, it's totalitarianism. And that's where, and Rick just, in, dot maps just sort of inserts itself in there. It looks like good work, but to my mind, it's been good work at all. He's been fleecing the population, tricking them with his charm, saying he's going to help them while feathering his own nest. Stan Groff will often say that he's just kind of bored by this next wave of research that's happening now. Um, from what I understand, Stan is more interested in art now and bar barely interested in the research whatsoever. Um, I've been pretty, I hate to say it, bored with the research as well, but it's, you know, other than the neuroimaging stuff, like I haven't been too excited um, by too much. Uh, how does it, yeah. so when you, have you engaged Rick in any kind of public debates at all? Well, no, not too much. I mean, we see each other every once in a while and, you know, we're sort of, we have, we're like, uh, no, I haven't engaged him in any public debate. I almost went to Prague last month to do that, but, um, I had something come up here and so I, I didn't, I didn't go. Uh, he won't debate me. He knows that, um, he knows that I know where the bodies are buried and um, he's, you know, he kind of shuts me out of everything that he tries to do. It's been at a considerable cost to my career as a, as a professor. And, um, but uh, I would love to. 
um, I have engaged him in some private email sort of debates, but um, if you want to try to set something up, that would be terrific. Um, I agree with you about, I'm, look, I'm, I'm 100% in favor of research. I consider myself a scientist. I was doing psychedelic research, you know, back in the, in the you know, early 1980s. I've taken people, you know, done cancer research with ayahuasca. And um, I'm all for research. Um, I think I disagree with, you know, like Leary had, uh, you know, stopped research. Leary didn't stop research. You know, Leary was just being a, an Irish rebel. And he, and he did the research and he made more researchers than anybody. You right. know, you know. Cool. So we're about in an hour and a quarter. I feel like we could talk for another seven hours. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> so maybe yeah, we should start we, to wrap it up. I'm glad we got some of this stuff out. I'm sorry if I got a little bit ranty. Oh. I think we have put out some good things and maybe a, a good discussion will follow from here. We'll have to have you back follow. on. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, any final remarks on my end? No, just thanks for sharing your story. And I, I, yeah, I just would really encourage people to do some more research. And, you know, what you've been kind of throwing at us, it makes me want to dig in and, and do some more research on some of this history because, you know, some of it I'm unfamiliar with. And so some of this is really new to me. And I'm just like, hmm, how do I approach this now? Um, so yeah, just c encourage other people to get out there and just kind of dig into this and yeah. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, if there's anything else I can do to spark a conversation, I'm glad to, um, Kyle, I'm probably going to be in Vermont, um, for a month or so this fall. If you're still out there, we ought to connect and, um, that'd be lovely. And well, let uh, me know. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, mention my books too. You know, that's part of these things. If people listen, I've, I've published, um, my first book is called Entheogens and the Future of Religion, which Houston Smith says is the best single inquiry into the religious significance of psychedelics. I'm very proud of that. A, a collection of writings that come from conferences and uh, interviews that I conducted in the early 1980s. Um, and then I did, um, uh, we didn't talk about the Albert Hoffman thing, but um, then I decided to connect with Leary. And so I did a book uh, about Timothy Leary, his memorial volume. I did it. Um, I was living at his house during the last year or so of his life, several days a week. It's called the Outside Looking In. And some really important and um, interviews in there, conversations with people like Andy Weil and Houston Smith and Richard Alpert and uh, Myron Stoleroff about the uh, about the you know some of the stuff that we've talked about. I didn't get too much into the CIA then because I wasn't I wasn't didn't really know as much as I know now about it. And um, so, it'd be nice to see more people reading those books. And um, really appreciate the work you guys are doing. I've checked out your website, and I do I do see that you understand this multi level thing and aren't just falling for this um, hype and um, so I hope we got um, some good material out there and appreciate your time. Absolutely. Robert Forte, thanks for joining us and really excited to have you on again in the future. Hey, thanks a lot. Welcome back from that interview. I hope you enjoyed it. So <laughs> what do you think? Um, definitely let us know. Psychedelics Today, email at Gmail. Really would love to hear from you and, and your thoughts. Um, I... I, for one, think Robert's very thoughtful. Um, he's been around forever, obviously has known gazillions of people in the psychedelic movement that I'll, you know, have passed. So he has been in the thick of it for, for a really long time. He's had interesting access. Um, and, you know, that's this is where he's landed. Um, any of you could land anywhere <laughs> in, in this opinion spectrum. Um, I don't know. I, I advise reading more books, you know, learn more about MK Ultra at the very least. I'm really interested in some of those documents he was talking about from the Wasson archive. Um, I mean, it would be really interesting to see some of those. And, you know, I think I've seen him post different things like that on Facebook. And it, it has been really interesting to follow, like, some of his, his story and see actually see some of these documents. But I'd love to dig in a little bit more about that and um, 
you know it is really interesting it's like a piece of history it's like is this true and it would be really cool to see some like facts about that because if it is like well, why aren't people talking about it you know <laughs> i hate to say this guy's name but i'll do it jan irving had a whole series of podcasts about like the huxley connection and i i was really drawn in i i wanted him to prove it like I, I for whatever reason i was just sucked in and raptured going okay great this looks really cool i'm really excited for you to lay this out for me and to me he never laid out a smoking gun like he he did here and there lay out that some of these people had fascist or far right-leaning tendencies but it just never seemed much more than that um you know, I, I, I always was ready. Like I was, I'm reading this book right now, um, Devil's Chessboard about Dulles, the CIA chief, um, longest running CIA chief. And, you know, I, I was ready. I was wanted that smoking gun to make me believe he was doing Nazi stuff. You know, it depends on what you want to say Nazi stuff is, right? Like is Nazi stuff, ex, you know, exterminating um, undesirable races? You know, that's pretty fucking blatant and intense and, and particular or is it a far right leaning fascist um plutocratic thing where like you have five companies running running the country you got like <laughs> what um comcast uh a pharmaceutical company and like nbc and fox and like those are the four companies that you're allowed to that are licensed <laughs> and everything else is mm -hmm. out. Is that what you're talking about? Or is it like a suppression of the left, uh, which is also part of it? Like that's why Nazis and USSR didn't get along. It was like one was far left and one was kind of far right. Um, and, you know, I I don't know. Like what do you think about that little rant there? Um, yeah, like I said, I think at, towards the end of just like trying to do more research on this stuff, um, you know, I, I don't know, too, like, you know, I, I'm not too familiar with like, um, political history. So I always have a hard time commenting on these different aspects. So, um, you know, this is something I feel like I need to brush up on. Um, so this was, you know, just reflecting on the interview, like a little bit challenging to me. Cause I guess I didn't have a lot of this history to kind of be like, how do I ask questions about this? Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. Something else that came up for me towards like uh, in this interview is the whole thing about maps. Um, and, you know, that is a really tricky conversation. And, um, you know, I, I really support what they're doing. Um, I think, you know, we need to kind of uh, be doing some of this research to get it legitimized, but also, you know, questioning whether that's the only model and, you um, you know, I think we should have alternative models once these things become legal and, and, you know, maybe they're not the only one. Um, so, you know, and, and that I think is probably gonna shake some people up too. Like if you're listening and that was like, Whoa, that was a lot to take in what he was saying about, you know, Rick and, and maps. Um, and so, yeah, that, that felt really, um, I don't know what I want. Like, it felt you know, challenging. It felt really like shaking, challenging. Yeah, and you know, I hope I did an okay job challenging that. But uh, yeah, let's maybe dig into that for I'd a minute. Probably the maps conversation. I probably could. We probably could have challenged a little more. Sure. Yeah. You know, I wanted to let him. We we always want to let our guests say their part more so than we want our part to be said most of the time. But so if so we time will tell what maps does right maps is doing research that is very necessary to get approval from the federal government and just based on the kind of federal quagmire we're in this is what needs to happen to play within that system we're clearly not going to take down the u.s government to make drugs legal so let's play with inside within the u.s government you know rick did his policy degree public policy degree at harvard i think that's where his phd comes from and you know that's how he knows how to play the system so great the problem might come into place if, so time will tell what MAPS does with this. MAPS should have some sort of um, time-limited exclusivity to their therapy model. I think what we're talking about, people can correct us if we're wrong, five years of exclusive license to be approving MDMA therapy pro providers, um, at least in the States. I don't know if that's going to work internationally or not. We'll see. Um, and... 
the the problem we're seeing is that only maps trained therapists will be able to execute on the maps trained model at certain licensed centers um and while that raises additional money for psychedelic research it also excludes certain people from um providing and receiving this kind of therapy um and you know that's something that i'm sure maps has wrestled with and i know a lot of people have raised that to maps it's not this isn't like <laughs> oh they def yeah this isn't new they're <laughs> definitely wrestling with it <laughs> and i don't know what the right answer is um like i always want to say i'm an anarchist but i think that's meaningless because i'm really not i would prefer to be able to call the cops <laughs> to come over if somebody's breaking in but this these are conversations that i think the community i keep saying the word community i don't i just don't believe there's a psychedelic community anymore but <laughs> uh we need to realize that there's nuance and subtleties to these conversations it's not just like oh psychedelics will be legal it's like well yeah legal for those who have the the means um hopefully it works inside insurance companies um and soldiers soldiers mm-hmm. will have access and you know people with extreme race-based trauma or sexual trauma or whatever kind of trauma can get help like we want i want to see the most you know, kind of a utilitarian view, like how do we get the most people, the most therapy so they can live a happy and fulfilled life. Um, and you know, maybe like, I think most people at maps are thinking that, but you know, perhaps the model just runs the clock a little bit to, to make LSD and all these other compounds legal, you know, hopefully that's it. Well, and it's tricky too. Because, like, they're kind of mainstreaming this. And, you know, I think there's also maybe some, you know, we would want to see these things be more accessible. But, you know, they've been working so hard to do this for, I mean, for a very long time. like 30 years or something. And to have, like, a yeah, and to have, like, you know, five to ten year kind of training where they have to train the therapist, you know, after that, what does that do? Maybe it expands and it's a little bit more accessible. But it's kind of just, like, this is this is going to be big and you know, might need to just be contained to make sure things aren't the sixties happen all over again, to some extent where things just kind of go all crazy and wild. Um, you know, you kind of think about any sort of degree you, you have to go through tr- different trainings. Like, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, any somatic experience thing that I want to train in. It's like, you know, there's certain schools that have a certificate in that and you have to go through that and, you know, even look at breath work like GTT to be certified in holotropic. You got to go through GTT and that's just what it is. Um, to some extent, I understand like holding that integrity and whatever they're doing. But yeah, when people are suffering, I think that's where it gets challenging because people, you know, it's like now we need these things now. And I always come back to like, you know, kind of this tagline we always play, not psychedelics yesterday, not psychedelics tomorrow, but psychedelics today. How do we make this available today for people that are suffering? And it's it's tricky because there's a safety considerations. There's everything that's been happening from this from the 60s. And we're trying to navigate this. And I would love to see it accessible today. But um you know, it'd be like the wild west too. <laughs> it's, you know, you go back and forth. I don't know. That's how I think about it. Try to be conservative, but try to be really open-minded about it. Yeah. We are in a cowboy country, cowboy state of affairs here. You look at ayahuasca retreat centers all over, um, domestic or international or otherwise. And <laughs> minimal consistency between facilitators uh, you know that's fine but you know what's optimal how do we know what's optimal unless we're doing science if it's not science it's in a lot of ways religious dogma um this whole concept of natural philosophy that dennis has been raising dennis mckenna you know perhaps that's a decent alternative to like scientific method um i for one i'm okay with people doing it i don't really care just a different kind of fact it's like a hard proven scientific fact is still a provisional truth that could be updated later. Um, mm-hmm. Like Daniel McQueen just sent us this article about Rick Strassman criticizing the Hopkins research, for instance. And it was uh, criticizing their worldview in a lot of ways because in a lot of ways, the Spring Grove researchers, you know, Groff included, kind of made a religion of sorts out of these experiences. And that kind of clouded in a lot of ways their... Um, ability to do objective science 
it, theoretically, I don't totally agree with what this guy was saying. This is Strassman wrote this critique of Bill Richards' book. Um, but, you know, it, to a certain degree, he's he's right that we need to kind of like abstract meaning from results. Like, you know, we have these results, but, you know, do they mean anything religious or not? Like with religious significance. And that's a whole different area of study than like therapy. And I think we need to be really careful there. And uh, that's about all. I, I could only read half of it because the, the article was just so scathing. I'm like, that's enough, dude. Mm. That's enough. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get you're mad. See you later. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I guess to sum this up, there is a dark side. There is a light side. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. These are, you know, to use some groff language, like birth pains. Like we are, we are being born into new creatures here. Like we are going to have increasing access to psychedelics. Chemistry is becoming cheaper and cheaper to do. Um, the dark web has really enabled a lot of chemists to get what they need to do what they need to do to make a living doing this stuff. And um, it's just easier than ever to do chemistry. And as a result, we're going to have increasing access to this stuff um, in the underground and super easy to grow mushrooms. And more and more people are going to keep doing that. So we're in an increasingly psychedelic age and we're trying to battle this old paradigm of you know, let's use straight Groff language, these uh, uh, aquatic creatures with no lungs that's totally reliant on something else to a air-breathing, bipedal, um, semi-aquatic creature that's standalone. So we're totally reliant mm -hmm. on this umbilical cord, and then we're totally independent in a lot of, well, not totally independent, increasingly independent um, as we age. So... You know what? It, there's some metaphors there that we could learn from. Like, uh, <laughs> do we want to always ask for permission? Do we want to work inside the system? These are all adult decisions we have to make, and um, mm -hmm. it's complicated. It's scary. It's it's a whole new level of um, discourse that uh, that we're gonna have to deal with. And how do we keep people safe and out of this harm's is, way? Yeah, this is new territory, and um, you know, I think that also as it becomes more mainstream, there's a lot more people that are, are going to get and want to get involved. And in. what is that going to look like? And, you know, I think there's also like different parts of like what happens, you know, I mean that whole thing with like compass pathways, people having so many opinions about that. Um, this is going to happen. This is going to continue to happen as these things become more legitimized and, you know, it's going to spark a lot of feelings within a lot of people in this field. Um, and how are we going to navigate this? You know, it, it, it's almost like it was contained to a very small group subsect and now it's like kind of birthing out. And now there's all these different views and opinions and ways to work with things. And it's kind of chaotic. Um, yeah, we're in growing pains. And I think that's just something we have to realize. And, you know, not every system is going to be perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all trying to figure out what's the best approach. But I think it's important to just kind of question, you know, question things and show up with some integrity. And, you know, I think that's probably the most important thing is, does this feel right? Um, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One of Tim Leary's famous... got a lot of stuff going on in my head. <laughs> Tim Leary had this thing, TFYQA, think for yourself, question authority. And I think, you know, that's fundamental. Um, and yeah, do that, do all of that in integrity and, you know, try to live up to what you think you want to be. Um, ethics is a trippy, tricky subject. <laughs> so, you know, do that um, to the best of your ability. And yeah, maybe, maybe cool stuff happens. Let's hope cool stuff happens. And this field keeps moving. And it's important to keep, people in dialogue right like i think robert has been mm -hmm. shut out a lot of the time and why not converse with him here and there he's put out some pretty meaningful books um he's yeah. got a lot of experience let's tap him as a resource you know he's got a lot to say not just about the dark side but about the light side um mm -hmm. briefly on commodity i've i've wanted to blog on this for a little bit i've been trying i think i have a draft blog post going but like <clears throat> people are afraid of uh commoditization of psychedelics um to me commoditization is different from monopolization there's you know um 
maps like that that whole thing will have a price tag attached to it but they're the only organization for five years that can do it domestically um or i I don't know however intellectual property works globally and whatever um china has different views on what's (laughs) legal in the copyright world so maybe that's the place but in terms of compass pathways they've put down this patent um on gmp good manufacturing practice psilocybin so they threat which is what's required for pharmaceutical companies to push things through the research process and they theoretically will have a total lockdown on production of this drug for however long a drug patent lasts which could be like 20 years or something and that's something that is i don't think has anything to do with commoditization that is now a you know, full on thing you can buy for them at an extreme price. Um, mushrooms are super cheap. Like if you bought a $50, 3.5 gram dose on the street, you're probably paying double what you should pay. Um, so I think it's thousands of dollars for a dose of psilocybin, I think was the breakdown. I think it's at least above a thousand dollars a dose. Um, I could be really mm-hmm. wrong. Even if it's 250, I think that's still okay um, for pharmaceutical grade psilocybin. Um, two hundred fifty dollars a dose, but you know that's. Still and I extreme. think about this in 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 terms of like, say, is this just being used in clinical setting, whatever? Versus, I mean, mushrooms you can grow your own. Like, and if I don't know how the laws are going to end up shaping, but you know, maybe that's how it works in the clinical model. But if you're if you could do this more in like a psycho spiritual personal development model maybe you can go get mushrooms somewhere else and not pay the 250 for the synthetic in a clinical setting you know right they're the safest of all recreational drugs recently established but yeah it's it, there's so many options and you know do you want to just fight compass pathways or do you want to work for religious liberation like maybe make a religion in massachusetts or new york that's all around mushrooms or ibogaine like Ibogaine's a legal slam dunk. Um, like there's plenty of mm. you know <laughs> people from Africa in a real religion doing it that way. There's people in Mexico with a real religion doing mushrooms that way. Um, that way you have religious protection for always having these compounds on you, and you have a religious right to eat these things. And there's so many ways to approach this subject and make meaningful change. I just had a conversation with a lawyer yesterday out of Chicago who I, I think might, might end up doing some stuff like that, which would be really cool. Hmm. Um, I, I would love to get involved with that. It's just a matter of freeing up time. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anything else you want to say? No. Um, yeah, I think, you know, this episode is running pretty long with the intro and outro, but thanks for sticking with us. I think, you know, this, this, this episode just, I guess, brought up a lot of stuff for us. So we wanted to kind of debrief about it and just chat. Um, but yeah, we hope you enjoyed the episode. If, you know, you're feeling, if anything came up for you, please send us an email. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hit us up on Facebook too. Um, yeah. And again, if you want to support us, check out, uh, check out our website, psychedelicstoday.com. Uh, if you want to leave us a review on iTunes, that'd be super cool or Facebook. That'd be sweet. Um, if you want to get more educated on psychedelics, perhaps check out one of our classes, psychedelicstoday.teachable.com or psychedelicstoday.com to learn more. Um, our class is really jam packed with great stuff and, uh, odds are good. You could save a life by taking that class. So check it out we have a free version up if you want to do like dip your toes in the water and and what is a 30-day money back guarantee if you do buy the full one yes 30-day teachable allows that which is pretty nice yeah Um, no one's no one's given their money or got their money back yet or asked for it even so i think that means we're doing something right yeah a lot of great reviews so far and you know if uh you know, you can't support us Patreon or, or buying a course or anything like that. Feel free. I think, you know, the most important thing would be really helpful for us is if you take a piece of content that you really like an episode of one of our blogs and just share it, just share it around. I mean, natural kind of uh, growth that way really helps us out. spread the word. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. And see you on the next episode. Peace. <laughs>